we go to the store, or excuse me, it was to a restaurant. They said they were going to get something to eat. Um, next thing I know, they were running out. And when they were running out, they literally, my cousin said, hey, go, 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 go. And adrenaline and just, you know, not being somebody that's going to really think about consequences in a moment, somebody that was scared, 19-year-old kid, never been in trouble, can clearly see they just robbed this place. I hit the gas and I went. You know, we ended up getting away that night. But I think now looking at back at, you know, at that moment, I think that's when my PTSD really kicked in. Okay, so what's life? What was life like in Virginia? Virginia, I was the angry teenager now, even a little bit more angrier. Out the military, working at Walmart, which shout out to Walmart. Um, but I didn't have a plan. You know, I was just kind of making it, winging it, and eventually I ended up starting to hang out with an older cousin who had me about by about 10 years and he didn't have a plan either um and that you know that's when things started to shift or make a turn okay that's interesting so uh you started i'm guessing adopting certain things from your older cousin yeah i would say so you know it was it was adopting certain things because he was basically the only individual at the time i could connect to outside of a girlfriend that i had in Virginia and it was also I'm near family I'm near you know a cousin a male cousin for the first time I never had a brother growing up so it was like okay I, I could express loyalty I could be there you know through thick and thin um and I think he I think he fed that a little bit you know he played that narrative a little bit you know we had a conversation a few years ago and he kind of, you know, he he apologized about some things and expressed some things about, you know, our relationship. And yeah, it was real. All right. So let's talk about how what ended up the events that kind of got you into prison mm -hmm. or at least charged to go to prison. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Um, so <laughs> it's not a crazy story because it, as I started to age in the system, you know, I started to see guys come in under similar circumstances. For me, I had never gotten in trouble. I got out, I got kicked out of the military, um, be basically because of my behavior. I was arguing. I was getting into it with leadership stuff like that. But I never got arrested. I never, you know, went to jail. So, for me, I'm never been in trouble. I'm with the older cousin. I'm hanging out with his buddies. And I'm not really worried about that. You know, we're smoking a little weed, we're drinking, you know, we're just hanging out. I know they're into some stuff, but I don't know what they're into. One day, you know, they asked me for a ride to the store. We go to the store, or excuse me, it was to a restaurant. They said they were going to get something to eat. Um, next thing I know, they were running out. And when they were running out, they literally, my cousin said, hey, go, 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 go. And adrenaline and just you know, not being somebody that's going to really think about consequences in the moment, somebody that was scared, 19 year old kid, never been in trouble, can clearly see they just robbed this place. I hit the gas and I went, you know, we ended up getting away that night. But I think now looking at back at, you know, at that moment, I think that's when my PTSD really kicked in. Because even when we got away that night, it was I was looking out the window. I was paranoid. Um, and then next thing I know, they started to get locked up one by one. Um, and I just knew my time was coming. You know, I remember I was at, I was working, I was at work with my mother. She also worked at Walmart. She retired from there. She was a manager at the time. And I remember she was fussing at me. She was like, you need to quit smoking cigarettes. I was, we were leaving work. I was driving her home. And, uh, at the time we lived with my grandmother. And I said, Ma, don't worry about this the last cigarette I'm going to smoke for a long time. And when we pulled up to my grandmother's house, my grandmother yanked me by the shirt. She said, what did you do? And she got to fussing, and the cops had been there. They were looking for me. And it was the last cigarette I smoked. I looked at my mother. I said, I'm not going to run. I said, just take me. You know, go ahead and take me up the street. I'm, I want to stop by the corner store and get something to eat. And uh, that was it. You know, and that was, man, got to the police station. Um 
and got put in cuffs. And that was the day like everything, you know, really shifted. I couldn't hug my mother when she was screaming for me um, and crying because she was confused. You know, I was I, I no longer had control of my life. You know, that's that's when things shifted. Do you consider anything that you may have wanted to change about that? Man, it's crazy. Um, of course, I, I, you know, I wouldn't have wanted to put myself through that if I could have, if I could go back and avoid that. It was hell. Those seventeen years were hell. But I'm grateful for how I was used in the circumstance. I was able to help a lot of people. I was able to get a lot of guys, or at least help get a lot of guys home, even from behind those walls. Um, and I'm still, I have a reputation now with, you know, certain people that are lawmakers or politicians, or, you know, I, I talk to judges, I talk to prosecutors now because of the work that I started to do in prison. And I met my wife while I was in prison and my wife, she's, she's my, she's my, she's my everything. So yeah, I guess I wouldn't want to go through the trauma aspect, but at the same time, I got to believe I ended up exactly where I'm supposed to be. That's a good way of thinking things. So you enter into, I'm guessing you have a trial. I'm guessing, uh, no. what, was the re what was the results of the trial and how was the trial process? So no trial. Um, yeah. Yeah, and one thing I have to let everybody know, I, I'm not one to dress anything up. I'm super transparent. It was a BB gun. Nobody was uh, harmed even physically. But I s stood facing six life sentences because in the Commonwealth of Virginia, even though I was just in the car, never touched a BB gun, never went into the establishment, there was no accessory law. So I ended up getting charged with the same crime as the guys that went in there. And how robbery works is you don't get charged just for robbing a restaurant. You get charged for each individual that's within that establishment. So I was facing six robberies, six gun charges, six conspiracies, um, and six, which totaled six life sentences. I did not have a paid attorney. You know, I had a, a attorney that was given to me by the courts, which a lot of us, a lot of young black and brown men do because we, we don't come from the best financial situations. Um, so I had this pro bono attorney who <laughs> I know he was coming in drunk. His suit was disheveled and my future was in his hands. Um, they Did he give you up. any advice? Did he talk to you at all? No. Now, uh, you know, from being somebody that labored in the law library and now talks to professors and, and you know, other learned individuals, I know he gave me no advice. As a 19 year old kid, he he gave me hope. You know, what what else do I know? My mother doesn't know the legal system. Nobody else is tied to me does. So I have to take this because I have nothing else. Um, I did. I wasn't given a plea, but, you know, the opportunity to plea because I didn't cooperate. You, they gave me an opportunity to cooperate the first day. They gave me an opportunity to come home. And because I was a 19 year old kid that, you know, was watching BET and, you know, feeding in the hype, I kept my mouth shut. And hey, to some guys, that's the honorable and stand up thing to do. And to me, even to this day, it is in a lot of ways, but everybody else decided to take that opportunity and start selling. <laughs> so here you go, right? Um, so I, I wasn't given an opportunity to plea. And I was woke up one day early before my date was actually supposed to be for me to be in court. And they shuffle you out five o'clock in the morning. Anybody that doesn't know the process, you're shackled hands and wrists to waist, waist to ankles. Um, and you're brought into the courthouse and you stand in front of the courthouse, you know, and then they usher you in and you're sitting there and you're cold and you're miserable and your life as you know it is about to change drastically. They're going to take even more of your freedom right now, and you don't know. And I'm sitting in the bullpen, I'm watching guys go, one guy, two guys, still haven't spoke to my lawyer. These guys are coming back. One guy's got a life sentence. One guy's got 12 years. One guy got six months. I'm like, all right. My lawyer comes in. He says, hey, the best I can do is get you 35 years to do. 
And I'm glad I had enough courage because so many kids don't and teenagers don't. I had enough courage to say, I'm not doing that. We got to tell them something different. Well, they wanted you to plead guilty is what I'm hearing. They wanted me to plead guilty and take 35 years to do it, which means I would have been home in my 50s. Uh, as a 19-year-old kid with no guidance, no nothing, uh, he said, well, I got to tell him something. And he literally, I, I take about 20 seconds, and in that 20 seconds, I have to come up with a number that will suffice the courts that I can sacrifice for my life knowing that I didn't, it, nobody got hurt physically. I understand the mental and emotional trauma, but I was never been in trouble and here I am. And um, I said, what is the number I'm okay with? And he, I told him, I said, man, I just want to be home be before I'm 40. Cause I knew what I was facing. Guys were getting life sentences for robberies where I was at. 